Thank you everybody for uh, staying to the end for the Aussie. Uh, and today I'm going to be presenting my uh, presentation on forest landscapes and how they increase diversity of honeybee diets in the tropics. So I'll just begin by providing a brief uh, general introduction to honeybee diets, um, as I'm sure you're all familiar. Uh, honeybees depend entirely on floral resources in their surrounding landscape to satisfy their dietary needs. Um, these food sources consist of pollen and nectar that are consumed fresh directly from floral sources or collected and stored as bee bread, which is generally a mixture of fresh pollen, enzymes and nectar for later consumption. <coughs> so as nectar and honey have a lower water content and uh, preservative properties, stored bee bread uh, maintains most of its nutritive value in times of resource scarcity, generally in winters or when uh, floral density and abundance is low or the weather conditions simply aren't suitable for foraging. Um, and these uh, floral sources do vary widely depending on the environment surrounding honeybee colonies, and this can affect the honeybee's health. So what's required to maintain honeybee health? Well, honeybees, like other animals, have nutritional needs uh, that are usually met by uh, the quality of the pollen and the nectar that they collect, where the nectar provides carbohydrates and minerals and pollen provide protein and fats in a macro sense and each floral source contains a combination of these nutrients in various concentrations uh, and in order to balance their overall nutrition and avoid deficiencies honeybees usually need to collect a, a good diversity of floral forage for optimal health and to maximize the colony's fitness overall. So as the nutritional value of pollen varies with species composition it is important to understand the diversity available in the landscape surrounding those honeybee colonies. Um, these landscapes change seasonally across climates and uh, are dependent on land use as well. So depending on the environment, highly diverse landscapes may provide species with complementary nutritional value uh, or in low diversity environments, there may be deficiencies. So uh, in a tropical sense, tropical environments, the floral diversity is generally high, particularly in rainforests uh, due to higher tree diversity in part. Um, and it's generally high in particular um, compared to temperate Mediterranean landscapes in some contexts where much of the floral diversity is found in herbaceous flowering taxa uh, and fewer uh, floral sources from sort of coniferous and deciduous trees that can provide limiting flowering abundance comparatively. Um, and of course, there's many exceptions to that in Australia here, in Africa and elsewhere where tree diversity can absolutely contribute uh, considerable diversity from trees as well. Uh, though as it relates to bees, uh, flora in the tropical context is really quite unknown. So tropical and temperate forests may share some ecological resemblance. However, the flowering season tends to be longer in tropical forests with some studies showing continuous flowering almost 10 months out of the year. Uh, in natural temperate environments, flowering abundance and diversity is very high. They're usually limited to shorter seasons sometimes. And uh, there's emerging evidence showing that urban gardens and supplementary floral sources uh, are acting as sort of a buffering of typical season phenologies. Um, but in order to collect pollen and nectar, honeybees need to navigate the landscape. And uh, honeybees tend to be more effective and cover greater distances in open sort of simple landscapes and cover sometimes less distance in more complex landscapes where there's less clear pathways to and from the hive. So while it's well established that uh, tropical forests contain high floral diversity and abundance, a buffering of access to diversity may also be affecting the diversity accessible to honeybees in tropical forests, um, as well as landscapes that become more fragmented uh, so forest edges rather than forest flora could be attracting honeybees to a suboptimal diet. So beekeeping is practiced globally, obviously, and uh, in different climates and continents, though production is clearly concentrated in temperate Western countries. Um, many countries in the tropics and tropical climates have also been producing honeybee products and managing hives commercially for several decades. In Papua New Guinea, for example, since the 1970s, and in recent times, uh, they've seen a resurgence in honeybee management and honey production. Uh, between 2016 and 2018, there was some data showing that there's an increase in raw honey production in Papua New Guinea from 10 to 48 uh, metric tons, which is fairly small compared, obviously, to the, na the national market, but for them, uh, a considerable increase. Um, and for subsistence landholders, um, the average uh, income of beekeepers did increase from about 620 kina to about 1500 kina per year. That's about 550 odd Australian dollars per year. Um, and it is continuing to grow. So Papua New Guinea has a very, very rich floral diversity. One of the highest floral diversities of any island on earth, in fact. Um, 
but it also contains a mosaic of remnant forests, subsistence gardens, and agroforestry landscapes that are potentially valuable floral forage for honeybees that's uh, well worth investigating. So this uh, research was part of a Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research project, um, and we're working on value addition uh, for uh, environmental benefits for agroforestry systems in Papua New Guinea. And so we'd identified several research. Oh. I just got a note that the recording had stopped. Are we still going? Yeah, it seems okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, so as I was saying, so we'd, uh, we'd identified uh, several research gaps in tropical honeybee agroecology. So firstly, we find honeybee floral sources uh, from temperate um, environments are well studied, uh, but the impact of tropical forests on honeybee diets is very poorly understood, um, as well as the impact of honeybees on tropical forests uh, in a conservation sense. Uh, respectively. So we also only find a handful of studies exist on European honeybee diets in tropical environments, um, despite historical beekeeping practices and, and the economic value they bring. Um, and only one study exists on honeybee tropical forest flora, so in a forest context, um, and also no studies exist on honeybee pollen, etc. So there were some fairly broad research gaps to address there. Um, and for this particular study, we chose to ask the following questions. So we like to know uh, how the diversity of bee bread compares between forest and non-forest landscapes in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and secondly, we're asking uh, what are the key floral species and plant groups in bee bread in each landscape so that we could provide some uh, detail for apiculturalists and beekeepers more generally in, in PNG. So the study sites for this research are in the eastern highlands of Papua New Guinea, uh, as per the map you can see on the screen there. Um, we selected eight sites in total based on the presence and absence of forest within two and a half kilometer radius of each hive site in order to capture a fairly generous foraging range. Um, four sites contain forest above 20% of the total landscape area and four sites contain no forest within the two and a half kilometer radius. Um, image to your left you've seen they're taken from two of these sites and show the, the difference in landscape. Um, we used a stratified sampling method to collect bee bread from frames in hives over two seasons, and that provided a total of 162 samples. So to identify plant species in the bee bread samples, we first uh, extracted DNA from all 162 samples. We use the RBCL gene markers to provide us with unique species sequences uh, as our library from flora and PNG consists of plant taxa uh, mostly from the RBCL region. So we use meta barcoding uh, to identify the plant species. We then sequence samples using MySeq to generate that molecular data for identifying plants in mixed pollen samples. Um, and then we use bioinformatics pipeline uh, that was quality controlled and poor quality reads, potential artifacts sort of less than 1% we removed. Um, and the final data set was used to match against the library of existing plant profiles uh, compiled from Papua New Guinea flora also far north Queensland that share a lot of that flora, worldwide cosmopolitan uh, plant taxa that we knew occurred in that area as well. We then used um, generalized linear mixed models to test for differences in the species diversity and abundance between forest and non-forested landscapes uh, in order to account for any confounding from our stratified sampling methods. So we're able to identify a, a total of 89 taxa uh, and to a species level, 61 species, uh, which is quite good for the RBCL gene region. So while it is quite good in, in determining abundance, it can sometimes be tricky to uh, get that narrow taxonomic resolution. So we're fairly pleased with that. Um, the species included uh, Lucana leucocephala and Syzygium unipunctatum were the most abundant species occurring in both of those landscapes. I know it's fairly tricky to see, but they're gonna be the, um, the center uh, species there and on the top. Um, and other common species included, uh, so introduced High Lotus Mimnutiflorum, Biden's Pelosa, and a native food crop uh, Antartophasloides, which is a big bean. Um, we also found a near threatened IUCN, IUCN listed rainforest tree, Helicia latifolia, uh, and that was found in both forest and non forest landscapes. So interesting to see that they were uh, foraging on, on rainforest trees in particular. 
Um, we also found wind pollinated species in both landscapes, and that included Araucaria, some Pinus species, uh, Norfolk Aci and uh, Poaceae, which of course is grasses, um, which I think by now, I think people are familiar with uh, bees foraging on, on grasses, in particular tropical grasses. Um, we then categorized the floral sources into plant groups, and we found uh, trees were the most abundant floral source, followed by the herbaceous species and crops, and then some minor sources from grasses and shrubs. Um, we used the GLMs to analyze the differences in abundance data between these landscapes, and we found uh, herbaceous species were significantly higher in forest landscapes compared to non-forested landscapes, but that was the only uh, significantly different uh, uh, plant group that we found. So bee bread diversity was significantly higher in forest landscapes, showing honeybee foraging, uh, honeybees were foraging on more uh, species at a greater abundance compared to flora in non-forested landscapes. And species evenness was also higher in forest landscapes, uh, showing diversity of plant species were sort of evenly foraged on at higher abundances uh, when they were in those uh, forested landscape uh, compared to non-forest landscapes. So again, summation, so we found species diversity and species evenness of bee bread was particularly higher in forest landscapes. And, and this is important uh, as the diversity is associated with better nutritional balancing in honeybee diets, um, where forests may serve as a healthful resource for honeybees in the tropics. Um, trees are the most abundant plant source in bee bread samples that we found, and they constituted almost 50% of the total abundance of bee bread um, that bees were seeking out. Um, and they were seeking out floral tree sources, even in landscapes where trees were particularly scarce, which is highlighting the importance of trees uh, for honeybee diets in tropical landscapes. Um, interestingly, the herbaceous plant tax of pollen was higher in forests compared to those non-forest landscapes. And that may be due to some sort of, uh, we hypothesize some sort of dilution effect perhaps of foraging effort that's sometimes seen when light gap phases emerge in closed canopy environments, as well as those edge effects from forest boundaries. Um, and we also found honeybees collect pollen from agroforestry timber species and crop species to make bee bread. So it presents us with the potential for the integration of beekeeping with agroforestry species, um, agroforestry practices and conservation of native flora. It's at risk of extinction in PNG, but unfortunately a lot of the area is. So just as a final, um, we also uh, constructed a book from our findings uh, written for subsistence locals in the Eastern Highlands of Papua New Guinea. So the book's been printed and distributed to farmers in PNG. Um, we've got a commitment to print another thousand copies. And we've also translated the book into local language talk pigeon for accessibility. So there's over 700 odd languages in PNG. Many of the locals have fairly low literacy, but they do share that common pigeon language. Um, so this book's currently being used by Department of Ag uh, in PNG University of Groka as well um, to sort of help with their recent, um, uh, I guess, uh, interest in beekeeping and also agroforestry management. Um, and we're making that available for the National Agricultural Research Institute of Papua New Guinea as well for people who couldn't get a book. Uh, so in that, I say thank you so much and I invite any questions we have. I hope I didn't run too far of its time. Thank you. No, Chris, you did perfect in terms of time. Uh, Guard has his hand raised. So Guard, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. I seem to like to ask questions. Thank you very much. Um, the very first talk of today started off, we heard all about the negative impacts of honeybees on endemic bee species. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious the ethical and I guess philosophical thoughts you have about promoting an exotic species in a tropical environment. Absolutely. So. Me, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to criticize you because no, 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 I'm involved no. also in beekeeping development activities and I understand yeah. the benefits of them, but there is a, there's a conflict here. Yes, I run that line on a personal level also. So my, um, I started out my I sort of academic career studying native bees in Kangaroo Island in South Australia. So for me, it was a tricky thing to navigate, I suppose. In Papua New Guinea, they have been managing honeybees since the, since the 70s, at least in the highlands. And in the lowlands, sometimes they'll use Apis serrana, but it's not quite as effective for the honeybees. Um, I guess, particularly for subsistence farmers up there who are poor and it's difficult for them to get access to education. So they're not gonna be putting in 
grant applications to the government to, to preserve their forests and they're not going to be getting subsidies from the government to buy medicine for their children. So honey has been a way to sort of supplement a lot of these uh, subsistence living situations um, and provide them with a bit of extra extra money. Um, in terms of the impact on the ecology, it's really difficult to say in Papua New Guinea because there simply is just nothing been done. So whether they find a similar sort of outcome that they have in Australia where um, the honeybees are getting into hollows and displacing birds or uh, perhaps like some of the arboreal uh, marsupials and things like that, because we do share a lot of that ecology in far North Queensland and Papua New Guinea, I, I don't know. In terms of the, the bees, how they are competing with native bees, because they do also have tetragonula species there, and they have uh, Asian honeybees, Apis serrana, and I'm sure Hylaeus and a few different species, which um, some of the more uh, informed people could probably correct me on. Um, there's simply nothing done, and I think we may find like later on that um, they are impacting negatively uh, on, on the native flora, but um, the native flora is being destroyed in, in such a fast fashion that, you know, using honeybees, I suppose, as a way to give them an importance of the forest, a reason to save that forest for me is buying us time rather Thank than you. having it logged. Thank you. That's yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, if anyone has any other questions for Chris, you can pop them in the chat and I'm sure. Oh, Amara, okay, let's squeeze in your question and then we'll throw it back to Carolyn after. Uh, yeah. Oh, I think my camera is not working, but uh, yeah, so you used uh, RBC and I'm, again, I'm, uh, I'm curious about uh, why, uh, uh, why you didn't try uh, uh, another gene like uh, the internal spacer. Yeah, we wanted to try it. Well, we wanted to use ITS2 at the time. Um, the reason being largely was because of the a, uh, the barcodes that had already been sequenced were largely from RBCL from a lot of other studies. So we were limited in the sense that we didn't have the resources and time to go into the forest. And, you know, that would have been probably two or three PhD students work to generate those barcodes. So I wanted to make sure that we could capture the most amount of native flora as possible. And unfortunately, most of those had been done on herbivory studies and some other stuff um, with, with um, flora of Papua New Guinea. So we had to use that RBCL marker, um, but I did definitely want to use uh, ITS. We wanted to, to multiplex too and use both so we could get a good abundance as well as better taxa resolution, but um, we were just uh, limited by the difficulty of um, going into PNG and <laughs> collecting plants. Um, however, there is uh, the lay herbarium has many, many, many um, samples that are just sitting there waiting to be barcoded. So if anyone's interested in doing that and creating a database of PNG flora uh, on a molecular level, please uh, contact uh, the lay herbarium and see if there's something that can be sorted out there.